good. Amen. Happy Father's Day to all the dads out there. So thank you so much for what you do for your families. And we just wanted to tell you a couple things just before we get the service going here. Um, if you picked up your bulletin, don't forget to fill out your connection cards for us, especially if you've got a prayer request. The staff loves to pray for you. So if you'll just take those and put them in the offering boxes at the end of the service, um, fill them out while Kurt's preaching. That's probably the best time to do that. Sorry, Kurt. I'm sorry. So... Other than that, we've got some other stuff. Don't forget to look at your bulletins. I know Brad's going to bring some announcements later, but there's some good detail in there for you. So if you didn't grab communion on the way in, uh, you might want to grab one now while we do the greeting time, because it's going to take you the rest of the service to open that up. So make sure you have those with you. God bless you, and let's greet one another in the name of Jesus.
Hey, the guys and I thought we'd do a song for the dads real quick. And the cat's in the cradle and the silver spoon. Little boy blue and the man in the moon. Okay, we're not going to do that song. So, since it was funny, I'll give the credit because Ben thought that would be kind of fun. So anyway. <laughs> All right, here we go. You are the strength of my heart. You are the strength of my heart. I can rely on you. I can rely on you. Amen. All right, let's talk about God, our rock. Amen. My heart is overwhelmed, I will look to you alone. God, my rock, God, my rock, God, my rock. You will stand when others fall, you are faithful through it all. God, my rock, God, my rock, God, my rock. In the blessing, in the pain. Through it all, you may. Pick up the white flag and raise it high and 
drop everything that we're trying to do and just let God, amen? Let's think about it. The battle rages on As storm and tempest roar We cannot win this fight Inside our rebel hearts Come on now Let the war be over because Jesus Christ is risen with victory. Lord, we just lay that at you. We take our burdens, all the worries that we have through the week. and Father, we just give it all to you. We raise those flags. Lord, we just give up. You've got to take control. Thank you, Lord, for your love and your grace for us. Thank you, Lord. 
we love and adore you. We want to give you all the honor and praise and glory. Lord, thank you. Bless us. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen. You may be seated. Happy Father's Day. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. Did this at the uh, 8 o'clock. I'm, I'm curious here. Uh, the church I grew up in, one of my favorite traditions on Mother's Day and Father's Day was they uh, like to have these contests to see uh, who had the most kids. So dads in the room, I'm curious. I've got three. I know some of you can beat me. Who's got more than three kids Okay, over here, I can only see like half the room, so I'm going to take your word for it. Um, okay, who's got more than four? Over here's one. Back there's one, more than five? Still over here? All right, you win the grand prize. James, oh, James, okay. More than six? All right, back there still wins, okay. <laughs> How many kids you got? Eight, eight kids. So that, that wins the prize, which is just being recognized as having the most kids. There's no actual <laughs> physical prize, sorry. Uh, but uh, yeah, that was always one thing that was fun for us. It, it was always fun growing up to see who could have the most family with them at church. My grandma usually came in second. Uh, there was one family that just managed to beat us and... Um, just say it nicely, we outlasted them. Eventually, we, we got more than they did <laughs> over the course of time. But um, yeah, it's great. Happy Father's Day to all you dads out there. I, I, I saw something one time that always stuck with me. A dad's job is to complain about his children doing things that kids do and to know random things. And I'm getting pretty good at both of those. So I'm, I'm uh, happy to be, be right here with you. Uh, we're glad you're with us today. We are... Uh, Getting to the end of this series we've been on for a few weeks now called So Many Questions, where we've answered some of the big questions that we can have in our faith or that can block our faith, questions uh, that are out there kind of like, uh, why would a loving God allow pain and suffering in the world, or does science contradict faith, or uh, can I still trust the Bible, or how do I know God is real? And I just want to encourage you, if you've missed any of these, or if you would like a refresher, these are all on our Facebook page. They're all on our, our YouTube page, which you can get to from our website. I would encourage you to go check some of those out. Uh, today, I'm going to give you my, my final question from the series. Brad will wrap the series up uh, next week with one last question. But mine today is a little different. It's not necessarily a heavy question like some of these we've dealt with. Some of these have been big questions. This one's maybe more one of those questions that all of us have faced at some point in time, a question that can kind of almost nag at us a little bit at times. It's a simple question, but doesn't necessarily have a, an easy answer when we're stuck in the middle of it. But the question is this, why do people get stuck in their faith? Curious, kind of show of hands here, how many of you, you've been a Christian for any length of time and you've had a moment where you just felt stuck? Anybody? Most everybody in the room. Like, like, it's not a bad time in life. It's not like we talked about a few weeks ago with the pain and the suffering or, or one of those where you're really questioning God or, or questioning the Bible, but you just kind of blah. Like, things just aren't going that well. And, and it's just kind of this, this, this flat feeling in life. Maybe, maybe that's the case and you're there right now. Like, I'm not going to ask you to show me your hands if you're there right now, but I would bet some of you probably are. That's just natural. It's kind of a natural part of life in anything that we do, relationships, our jobs, etc. It stands to reason we're going to get that way in our faith at times too. If you're stuck in your faith right now, okay, if that's you, I got a couple of things that are, are bits of good news for you. First, you're not alone because I think we've all been there. You just saw the hands go up. We've all been there at some point. And a lot of us that aren't there right now may get there again sometime soon. It just, it happens. It's easy for that to come across. But number two, I think the answer to getting unstuck is actually very simple. And that's what we're going to kind of look at and explore today a little bit is, is how we get unstuck and then how we can avoid getting stuck in the future. What I want to look at today, though, first off, are the two main reasons I think we tend to get stuck in our faith. 
The, the, the reason we get to a point where we just kind of like shrug our shoulders and like, God, really, is this all there is? Like, I kind of thought this would be better. Or I thought my life would be richer or I thought things would be, be clicking in a little different way than they are right now. Again, not to say that things are bad, but just that they could be better. If that's the case, let's look at a couple reasons why I think we tend to get stuck. The first one is this. We can, uh, can get stuck because we, we try out our faith rather than train in our faith. Now, here's what I mean by that. Some of you are old enough to remember the, 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 the uh, time period before cable TV existed. Okay, a lot of heads nodding there. I'm just old enough to remember the beginnings of cable TV. Like, I'm, I'm, some of my first memories as a kid are, are hearing about these new cable-ready televisions. Remember those? What did we have before those? You had a box that went on top of the TV, right, that plugged into the back. And if you were like me at about five years old, you were your parents' remote control. Like, hey, get up and go flip the switch on top of the box. And you go up there and you, you flip the little switches back and forth. And then we got, you know, really high on the hog. And we got that cable box that had a remote control. And we didn't have to get up anymore. And eventually we had cable TV and satellite TV. Now, four decades later, we have streaming. Everything's streaming these days. And streaming comes with free trials. You can get a month for free or a month for a dollar or, you know, three months for five dollars or something like that. Everything has free trials, it seems like, these days. I think we kind of think our faith works the same way. Like, we can just try our faith. But faith doesn't really work that way. Faith costs us something. Faith costs us everything. Go back a couple weeks ago. If, if you weren't here, I talked about uh, the question of if, if, if I didn't know Jesus, how would my life be any different? And I kind of put out there that too often we think if we didn't have Jesus in our lives, we, didn't, uh, we wouldn't have any rules. And I said, that's actually not true. We just would make our own rules. We would set our own rules because everything in life ultimately has rules and has boundaries and requires discipline. We can't grow in any area without boundaries and discipline. To illustrate that, I played golf this week. Went with uh, a few of the guys from the church here. Uh, we went out to Burning Tree Golf Course over in DeSoto. And uh, I told them right off the bat, we were playing a scramble format. I said, guys, I've swung my clubs once in the last year. Don't expect much from me. And so, of course, on the very first hole, with people watching, it's about a 400-yard straight down the middle par four, I hit my drive to about 120 yards from the hole. Just crushed it. And they looked at me, and they're like, yeah, really? We're not supposed to expect anything from you? I said, don't worry. That'll be my only contribution. And it was. Because the next hole, which was 260 yards, I thought, you know what, if I do what I just did, I'll hit them on the green. It went 25 yards straight up in the air and landed in the bushes. <laughs> Why? Because I haven't swung my clubs in a year. I, I tried. I tried hard to play well, but I haven't trained. And that applies to everything. If you follow football, the Chiefs are in off-season training right now. Kickoff's three months away but they're preparing. They're not just going to wait for the season to show up and play. And that applies with everything for us, whether that's a hobby, whether that is, is growing in knowledge, whether that's growing in your career, whether that's getting started in what you do. You can't just show up and try hard. I tried really hard to hit the rest of my drives like that first one the other day. It just didn't happen. <laughs> I put a couple in the Kansas River. I, uh, you know, put one on the fairway next to us, you know, that said they didn't count as a fairway in regulation, by the way. I disagreed, but whatever. The point is this. It didn't matter how hard I tried. I needed to train. Trying can never replace the power of training. And I know some of you may be thinking, you know, we're, we don't really need a sermon that kind of sounds like a corporate leadership seminar here today, Kurt, but hear me out, because training, our faith, is actually very biblical, in fact, there's many moments in the New Testament specifically that talk about training. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, he, he says, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? So run in such a way as to get the prize. Look at this. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. He says, They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Life takes training. Faith takes training. Parents, parenting takes training because as a parent, you are training. You're training your children. What's one of the most famous verses in the Bible on parenting? Proverbs 22, 6. What's it say? Train up a child in the way that he should go. 
And when he's old, he won't depart from it. It takes training. Your marriages take training. Life in general takes training. That's why we have mentors in life. One of my uh, former pastors used to always say, everybody needs a Paul and everybody needs a Timothy. In other words, we all need somebody that we can pour into, but more importantly, we need somebody that we can pour into us too. And he was a Paul to so many of us because he understood something very simple that if we think that we can just show up and do it and get the job done and anything else, golf, life, our jobs, etc. If we can succeed in those without training, how is our faith any different? We need to focus and, and, and grow in him. Speaking of Paul and, and Timothy, this is something Paul wrote to Timothy, to his protege. He says in 1 Timothy 4, don't waste time arguing over godless ideas and old wives' tales. Instead, train yourself to be godly. Physical training is good, but training for godliness is much better, promising benefits in this life and in the life to come. See, often I think we have this misconception as a church uh, that, that our, our job is to get people in the baptistry, that we get them here and we baptize them and, and, and they're good, we've done our job. That's not our job. That's part of our job. But baptism is not the end of the, of the story for anybody because the first step out of the baptistry is their first step on their walk with Christ. What's our job as a church? To train them to become like Jesus, to teach them and, and to show them and to lead them how to become more and more like Jesus. It's called discipleship. And too often, I think, as, as, as Christians, we forget that it requires work. We just think we've been baptized, we're plugged in, we're set, we're good to go. No, as long as we're alive and as long as we're breathing, we need to train ourselves day by day to become more like him. Second reason I think that we can get stuck in our faith is simple. We neglect this, that our training should engage our whole selves, our head, our heart, our hands. And too often, we forget that, and we focus too much on one of those three areas, and we neglect the others. And that's kind of where I want to camp out a little bit more today, because this is actually pretty pivotal. And this is something that I think all of us can be uh, can so easily fall into this trap of, of staying in one of those three areas. But we need to focus on the whole self. Jesus himself made it very clear to us. And when he told us the greatest commandment, remember this, he was asked, what's the greatest commandment of all? And what's he tell him? Mark chapter 12. He says, love the Lord your God with what? All your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. I love that he worded it that way because Jesus could have just said, love God with everything that you have. But no, he laid it out. He made a bullet point list for us with your heart, soul, mind, and strength. See, I think we can kind of visualize this a little bit more like this. This is kind of us right here. Can we have kind of these three aspects of, of how we live out our lives as Christians? We've got the head knowledge up in the left. That's how you grow in knowledge. It's how you grow uh, your intelligence. We do that through studying the word and, and, and going to a Bible study. Uh, on the right, we have hands. That's putting everything to action. That's serving that's actually doing the work. And then on the bottom, we have the heart. That's the compassion that's in it. And you can look at all three of those, and you say, well, they're all three very necessary. And, and yeah, we should try to live right there in the middle of all that. But too often, we drift into one of these areas and neglect the others. And I'll be very honest. It's very easy for me to drift to that top left. Not to say that I am an intelligent person. Not to say that I'm the scholarly person. But that's my comfort zone. Is at my desk with books in front of me, reading more, studying more, and forgetting about the other two. And I would venture to say that all of us, we, we, if, if we're not careful and not intentional, we can drift in one of those three ways as well too. What I want to look at today is to kind of look at this idea of overtraining in one of these three areas because here's kind of the truth of the matter. We tend to get stuck in our faith when we get out of balance in those three areas. When we get out of that little yellow mark in the middle and we move to one of the sides and we neglect one or we neglect two of those areas, that's when we tend to get ourselves in trouble. That's when we tend to get stuck because we neglect those. 
So what we're going to do is look at these three kind of classic examples of overtraining that we tend to see in the church today. And I just want to give you a challenge on this. If you recognize yourself as one of these three, if you're taking notes, write it down. Be honest with yourself. My job up here today is not to beat you over the head or stomp on your toes. That's not what I'm trying to do today. It may feel that way. But trust me, I'm kicking my own toes too. Because I I told the 8 o'clock service, I said, I may have been preaching to myself this morning. Because I can be guilty of this. Absolutely. So it's not, a, it's not a stomp on your toes or beat you on the head type of, of, of sermon. What I'm hoping to do is just show you, hey, be aware of these warning signs. Because if this is you, we need to fix this. And we're going to kind of wrap this up by looking at how we can course correct if you are in one of those three, three modes. So what we're going to look at are, again, the three classic examples that we see. The first one is what we call the, the feed me more Christian. Maybe you've heard uh, of of the feed me more Christian. You overvalue head knowledge. And I've heard this every church I have been in. Somebody will say, well, I'm just not getting fed enough. I need to be fed more. And what they mean is is, is if I'm preaching, hey, Kurt, your sermons aren't deep enough for me. Like, Like I need a steak and you're giving me milk. Well, here's a little secret. Every sermon I preach, I try to have milk and meat both because I'm preaching to how many people? And we're all in a different place. And so the feed me Christian just wants more and more and more. And, and we're never content and satisfied that we have enough. But that's kind of the feed me Christian. The danger here is, is the feed me Christian wants to learn more about the Bible because you think you will become more spiritual the more that you know. And I think you could see the trap that comes here. Because knowledge doesn't necessarily lead to application. And the feed me Christian tends to know more then they apply. They know more Bible, then they apply. And it's an unhealthy battle that we can get into. Think about this for a second here. You're, you're, you're consuming God's word, you're, you're devouring God's word, but you're not exercising. What happens if you eat all the time and never exercise with physical food? You're probably going to start gaining weight. You're probably going to get unhealthy. And the person who consumes God's word and never does anything with it ultimately will become an unhealthy believer. Now hear me, consuming God's word isn't a bad thing. And consuming more of God's word is a very good thing. All of us probably could do it more. But the the, the issue comes when we don't do anything with that knowledge that we acquire. I think you could say it like this, more Bible knowledge does not automatically correlate with spiritual growth. It just doesn't. More Bible knowledge does not automatically correlate with spiritual growth. Think about this for just a second here. Think about the Bible. Think about the Gospels. Who was it that knew the Scriptures the best? It was the Pharisees. They had the Bible memorized. They were required to memorize the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. Who did Jesus come after the most? The Pharisees. Why? Because they didn't know what to do with it. They weaponized it. They turned the Bible into this rigid sword to whip people into shape with. And they lost the fact that there needs to be compassion alongside it. There needs to be heart alongside it. They were so black and white, so legalistic, that they didn't know what to do. So you can see them as a perfect example that knowing the Bible doesn't mean much if you don't know how to apply the Bible. That's why the New Testament is full of of examples like James chapter 1 where it tells us don't just listen to God's word, but do what it says. Otherwise, he says, you're just fooling yourselves. Let me me just tell you, folks, it doesn't matter how many degrees you have up on your wall. It doesn't matter how many books you've read. If you have not put it to work, you're not living it out. And that's what they're warning us here today. Today. So kind of flip that statement from a moment ago about knowledge and spiritual growth. Knowing the Bible doesn't automatically correlate with spiritual growth, but applying the Bible does. Putting it to work will help you grow to become more like Jesus. That's why Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 8. We know that uh, we all have knowledge about this issue, but while knowledge makes us feel important, it is love that strengthens the church. Get this, anyone who claims to know all the answers doesn't really know very much at all. That kind of hurts a little bit. People who claim to know the answers, he says, don't know very much at all. 
The, the truth is that most of the, the feed me Christians, let's be honest, are educated beyond their level of obedience. They have so much knowledge that they don't know what to do with it. And it's a dangerous place to find yourself in because once you consider yourself an expert in something, you start to lose the ability to learn more. You start to lose the ability to be trained more and to grow more. Here's our second type of stuck Christian. It, it's the out of balance one that we call the feelings focused Christian. You're, you're focused on that circle on the bottom. Uh, you overvalue listening to your heart over the truth of God's word. And this is especially dangerous right now because our culture is very feelings focused. Our, our cultural climate, our societal climate is very much of the nature of follow your heart. And if it feels good, do it. And don't let anybody tell you you're wrong in doing that. Here's the issue with that. How many of you, you can show me your hands if you want to, you have followed your heart right into a terrible decision? There's a bunch of liars in here this morning. <laughs> I think we all have. Whether that is a bad relationship, whether that's a bad career path, maybe it's a bad investment. We followed our hearts and it led to something that wasn't good. See, the problem is the world, again, tells you we should follow our hearts, but the Bible tells us otherwise. In fact, the Bible gives us a very stern warning about following our hearts. In Jeremiah 17, it says, The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. If the heart's deceitful, then do we really want to listen to it and follow it? I know many times I have had my heart set on something and something in the back of my mind kept saying, no, this isn't right, but I really wanted it. I really wanted this. And I would say, God, just make my head and my heart line up <laughs> and then maybe that's the right way to go. Because our hearts lead us, our hearts tap into us because we have feelings and our feelings are, are good things because God gave us these. To, to have compassion or to have empathy or to have care or emotions, he gave us all of these things. And when our feelings are, are spiked, man, we just want to go in that direction. Now, here's the problem. It's a hard truth. We need to accept your feelings aren't facts. I know some people don't want to hear this, but feelings aren't facts. They're feelings. Again, they're, feelings can be good things. God gave us emotions for a reason. He wired us the way he did for a reason. But feelings, if we're not careful, can become distortions of the truth that we personalize to fit our own desires. And that's the danger that we run into. Now, hear me out on this. Compassion is necessary. For us to have the life and the love of Jesus, we need to have compassion. I don't think we can follow him properly without having it. We need to have empathy for the church to be the church. But we can't have one or the other. Too many times, especially today as Christians, we want to be all truth or all feelings. As my friend Caleb likes to say, love actually exists in the tension between those two. We have to have both. If we have all love, it's just rigid, and, and there's, we're just mindless robots. If it's all feelings, anything goes and there are no rules. So we need to find that tension. That's what Jesus did. Remember Jesus Finding the woman who was caught in adultery, what's he tell her? I don't condemn you, but go and sin no more. He doesn't excuse what she did. He calls her out on it, but he doesn't knock her over the head for it either. He tells her to go and live a life focused on him. That's where us as a church come in and try to find the, the, the overlapping circles between being truthful and being feelings focused. And too often, again, right now in our climate, we get stuck in one of those two competing against each other. What about that third circle that's on the bottom? This is what we might call the do things Christian. And this is one that's a little bit tricky because we want you to serve, we want you to be active and, and to put your faith to motion, but let's be honest, sometimes in this circle you overvalue the work of your hands and you don't have the proper purity in your heart. This is might, might be what we call the look at me Christian. The hey, look at what I'm doing kind of Christian. You do the right things, but for the wrong reasons. You're more concerned with what other people think and how other people might perceive you, more concerned about that than you are actually the work you're doing and who you're doing it for. And, and I see this because we look good on the outside, but on the inside, sometimes there's pride. 
Sometimes there's, again, that, that sense of I want to be known for what I do. And Jesus had some strong words about this. In Matthew chapter 6, he said, when you give to the needy, not if, but when, he expects you to serve. When you give to the needy, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. So let me ask you this. If you're serving, are you there to serve or are you there to post pictures on Facebook or Instagram? Are you there to help people or to look good? Because if you can't be honest and say I'm there to help others and I don't care what everybody thinks of me, you're not serving with the true heart of Jesus. When he told us the Son of Man came to serve, not to be served. Or maybe it's something else. Maybe it's not so much a pride issue, but you serve to cover some other things up. I've known some people, wonderful people, wonderful followers of Jesus, great servants of the church, but the more we kind of got to know them, the more we realized they actually served to mask some major issues going on in their lives, to mask some major problems going on at home, to mask things that they just didn't want to confront and deal with that they needed to for their own health, for their own soul, their own mind. They were just ignoring those, and the church was a good out for them. We need to be aware of this, too. We, we, we want to help you through the, the issues you're facing, but the church can't just be a mask for that for you. Jesus was clear about this in Matthew 23 when he called out again the Pharisees and the teachers. He tells them, you clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside, inside they're full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, he says, first clean the inside of the dish and the cup, and then the outside also will be clean. What's he saying there? Get your heart pure. Take care of some of the issues you're facing. Does it mean that you've got to have everything in order and be perfect to come and serve? Absolutely not, because none of us are ever going to be there. But at the very least, focus on those things. Try and fix those things. Address what needs to be addressed. Because here's the truth of the matter. When it comes to serving, especially the church or through the church, the purity of your heart is a key factor here. So it says in Proverbs 4, above all else, guard your heart. Guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. Folks, if your heart isn't pure, it's going to affect so much more in your life than just how you serve the church. An impure heart is going to affect your marriages. It's going to affect your children. It's going to affect your jobs, your coworkers, those around you. It's going to affect your church. So get your heart in line with Jesus. See, here's the problem. If you are selfish and your heart has selfishness in it, you're going to serve for selfish reasons. If your heart is full of pride, then you're going to serve for purely proud reasons. If your heart is full of hate, man, you're going to serve with a snippiness. You're going to serve almost to prove a point. Get your heart in line with God. Now, don't get me wrong here. We value you serving the church here. I'm not trying to tell those of you who serve, hey, you're doing it wrong. I'm not saying that at all. Because so, so many of you, you serve, and you're here for all the other things too. You're here to grow in your head knowledge. You're here to grow with your hearts. We see that. We are very aware of that. And we are so grateful that you serve here at Crossroads. We wouldn't be able to do what we do without you all. We have over 20-some-odd ministry teams, and every one of them is full of, of wonderful servants. But we just want you to be aware that if we're not careful, we're broken, we're sinful, and we can fall into that trap of serving for the wrong reason. So, so keep your heart in tuned with God. Because getting stuck can be one of the more difficult things that we face. Because sometimes it happens, and it's happened before we realize it's even happening. So what do we do about it? You may say, great, Kurt, you've, decided, you've uh, managed to just sweep my legs out from under me and made me face plant the floor today, so what are we going to do about it? Come back next week, we'll tell you how to get out of it. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. No, we'll, we'll, we'll give you some pointers here. How can you get unstuck? Or how can you avoid being stuck. Well, let, let's look at how we can course correct just a little bit here. We'll, we'll focus just really on one practical step each one of these, these three uh, types of Christians can take. The first one, if you're that, feed me more. Your course correction is you need to learn to put your faith into action. Put your faith into action. Take what you know and apply it. And the great way to do that, like we just talked about, is serving in the church. 
It's serving. Again, if you're the feed me more, your comfort zone is sitting probably alone, okay, at a desk, at a chair, at a library, at a coffee shop, somewhere, just pouring over more and more knowledge. So get involved. Put that knowledge to action. Let it work for the church. We've, again, we've got over 20 ministry teams. Every one of these ministry teams right now could use more workers, could use more hands on deck. Every, almost every team we have is shorthanded right now. And we have ministry team signups like in February, March, and we're probably going to do it again heading into the fall. You don't have to wait until then to sign up. If you're interested on that connection card in your bulletin, write down an area you might be interested in. We've got them on our website. Again, there's over 20. Drop it in one of our, our offering boxes on the way out. We'll have a team leader get in touch with you because we would love to have you serve and put what you know to action here in the church. What if you're the feelings-focused Christian? If you overtrain and overfocus on your heart, you need to simply rely more on God's word and not so much on your own feelings. Again, your feelings are a good thing, but they must be rooted in God's word. So get involved in one of our Bible studies. We have several Bible studies. Some actually are going to meet right after this service at 1045. We have some that meet throughout the week. We've got a handful listed, again, on our website. Check those out. If you think you might be interested in one, again, let us know. Email us. Drop a connection card in. These rotate through. We, we have some that last a few weeks, some that are ongoing. So look and see what we have available. We want to grow your knowledge, not just from the stage on a Sunday morning, but throughout the week as well, too, and get you plugged into Bible reading programs or get you plugged into other resources that complement Scripture that will help you learn and grow more in His Word. What about if you're that third group? You're the, the look-at-me Christian. You overfocus on your hands. Let's just be honest, we need to deal with the pride that comes in our lives, or maybe we need to deal with the brokenness that comes in our life that we're trying to hide, that serving can mask. We want to focus on those. We want to fix those. One of the best ways you can do that is to get into relationship with somebody else, a mentorship, a small group, an accountability group. Get somebody in your life that can pour into your life that can help you direct and lead your life. We've got small groups that meet. Some of them are taking the summer off. Some of them are still going on. But we've got those again. Check out our website. Check with Matt or with Phil. And you can find out more about those because we need to understand something. You're not going to grow simply by sitting in a, a chair on a Sunday morning or, or you're not going to grow simply by showing up to serve. We have some people who are wonderful people and I've seen this at every church I've ever been at. The only time they come to church is when they serve. You do need to be fed. You do need to grow in relationship with one another. So get into that. Life change happens not in rows, but in circles, around kitchen tables, around living rooms, at coffee shops, on the golf course, riding down a, a cart, heckling one another. We have men's and women's groups that are, are having activities coming up that will be a great opportunity to grow. We have Things for couples. We have things for families on the calendar. We have all sorts of activities coming up. Get involved. Get plugged in. If you're not, if this is your only interaction here at Crossroads, man, take that next step. Get more and more plugged in so that we can grow with one another. See, over-focusing on one area will cause us to get stuck. But the key to getting unstuck or avoid getting stuck in the first place is that we need to grow holistically. We grow the whole self, and we move from one of those circles or one of those overlaps into the middle. We move into that yellow area, and, and we see that when that happens, so much more is going to come out of this. Not just you, but everything that you impact and affect will be changed. Your marriage, your, your family life, your children, your career, your, your neighborhood, your church. It's all going to grow when we start to focus on our whole selves with Jesus. This morning I was uh, up early and was, was having my coffee, doing my, my Bible reading. Don't always get a chance to do that on a Sunday morning before I come in. But I'm reading through Acts right now, and that's a book I've read so many times and studied so many times. And God's always funny. Again, when you think you're an expert, God will show you something else. And I don't claim to be an expert on the book of Acts. 
but a book I'm very familiar with. And I read through Acts chapter 2, a chapter I'm very familiar with. And I read through one of the most well-known verses in the entire Bible. And just something this morning hit me in a new way. Maybe it was in light of this sermon. I don't know. But I read through Acts chapter 2, and Peter's preached this long sermon. And people are starting to come and, and repent and be baptized. And it says in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, that those people devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. They didn't focus on just one thing. They didn't just think, man, I heard a great sermon, I'm ready to go. Or man, I had a great time hanging out with these friends, I'm ready to go. They did it all, every day. And it says that the Lord was with them, and it goes on to say how they gave and they served to one another. And God was with them, and the church grew. Folks, if we want as a church to make an impact, to grow, it starts with us individually. It starts with us getting ourselves unstuck by not over-focusing on one area, but on focusing on becoming more and more like Jesus every single day. Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful for your son. We are so grateful that he gives us the example of serving others, that he gives us the example of showing compassion to one another, that he gives us the example of studying your word and focusing on you and bathing it all in prayer and bathing it all in fellowship. God, I pray that for every one of us, that would be our focus, that we would avoid those traps of becoming stuck. God, that we would avoid those times where we find a comfort zone in one area and ignore the others. But God, you would remind us that you didn't call us to be comfortable, you called us to follow you to become more like you. So God, I just pray today for every person here, if they're stuck now or if they're on the verge of becoming stuck, you would show them how to step out of that. God, you would lead them, guide them in all that we do to become more like you and your son. We pray this in his name. Amen. This is our time when we step into communion. It says the believers broke bread together. And that's a two-part statement there in Acts 2 that they ate together. They shared meals together, but they also shared the Lord's Supper together. As we do this, I, I always like to say every time, we do not do this because it's a tradition. This church has done this from day one, but it is not a tradition here. It's an intentional pause and an intentional reminder that I know I need in the busyness and chaos of my life of what Jesus did on the cross for me. Dying on the cross, shedding his blood for my sins, but restoring me to the Father and allowing us to be restored and reconciled to one another too. Let's pray. Father, we're so grateful for Jesus. I ask you would bless this time as we take this bread and we take this cup. We would bless this time as we bless you. We pray this in your name.
good morning. So uh, for Father's Day, the fellowship team has something a little special for all the dads, so uh, enjoy it. I've already done the taste test, and uh, it's good. It's good. All right, so you don't have to save one back for me. I've already had mine. Okay, I got three announcements that I want to make, um, and all of these are a couple of weeks out. So just want to make sure they are on your radar, although one of them you can go ahead and register, register for right away. But the first one has to do with prime time. And uh, at July's prime time, we are having someone come in and speak from advice and aid. We thought in view of everything with the Supreme Court and, you know, what's going on right now uh, and what may happen between now and uh, that date, um, that this would be timely. Uh, so the person we have that's going to come, that's going to speak, will talk some about, you know, what we've already heard uh, leaks of in regards to the Supreme Court, but they'll also be talking about the ongoing work of advice and aid. And uh, for some of you that have been around for a number of years, this uh, name will ring a bell, at least part of this name will. Uh, but uh, her name is Melody Throckmorton. Melody married Seth Throckmorton, Larry and Jamie's son. For those of you that have been around a number of years, those names ought to be ringing bells for you. And so anyway, Melody will be here and she'll be sharing at that prime time. Okay, school drive coming up. Uh, this is in two Sundays is when it will begin. We have not gotten the wish list yet as far as specific items. As soon as we get that, it will be posted on our website, so you might check back on the website. I looked this morning. It's not up there yet, but, but hopefully soon uh, that will be on there. And that drive will involve three Sundays, the 3rd, the 10th, and the 17th of July. And then lastly, we have a blood drive that is coming up, and this is one that you can go ahead and register for right now online, so you pretty much got your pick of time slots if you do it right away. Uh, as time goes on, you know, those will, um, that list will get a lot shorter. So, so uh, we encourage you to consider doing that. All right. Okay. Why don't we go ahead and have a word of prayer? As soon as I'm done praying, um, our worship team has another song they're going to be leading us through, but let's go ahead and spend a moment in prayer. Father, we are grateful for today. We're grateful for the opportunity we have to be able to meet in your name, and Lord, I pray that you are pleased and honored, and glorified by our presence today and by the attitudes of our heart, and, but Lord, I pray that you would be glorified as well as we go from this place and as you see the way we approach living our lives this week. You died for us. It's our time to live for you, and thank you for the privileged opportunity of being able to express our gratitude in such a way. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Let's sing that chorus together. <laughs> 